¿Qué tal? I'm Antonio Tijerino, host of the Fritanga podcast by the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. Today, we're shining a spotlight on a tremendous source of inspiration for me and countless others. Yes, we will explore her time on Earth, her time in space, and, I said explore, the impact of an extraordinary leader, Ellen Ochoa. Three, two, one. We have ignition. We have liftoff of Discovery on the second mission to Planet Earth research flight. As the first Latina astronaut to travel to space, Ellen shattered stereotypes, bounded over challenges, created her own expectations, and proved that the sky's not the limit. It's just the beginning of where she was headed. Ellen's journey is one of inspiration, curiosity, and a whole lot of grit and ganas. So today, we'll delve into her inspirations and discuss the pivotal moments that ignited her passion for discovery. We'll talk about breaking barriers and the incredible responsibility that comes with being a pioneer in any field, especially as a Latina. Dr. Ochoa's list of accomplishments are infinite. Not only has she flown in space four times, logging nearly 1,000 hours in orbit, but she's also served as the director of NASA's Johnson Space Center. After devoting more than 25 years to NASA, Ellen was inducted into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame in 2017, became vice chair of the National Science Board, and has won numerous awards for her success, including NASA's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal. And she got our Hispanic Heritage Award at the Kennedy Center. Aside from her stellar career, Ellen is also a passionate advocate for STEM education and diversity in the sciences. Through her work with organizations like the Hispanic Heritage Foundation, she is focused on inspiring the next generation of women and people of color to explore their potential and push the boundaries of what they are capable of achieving in the world of science and beyond. On this pod, we'll also explore the wonders of the universe together, diving deep into the role of scientific innovation. We will also talk about Dr. Ochoa having a Minecraft character in the Hispanic Heritage Foundation's Latin Explorers game that was played by millions of children across the world in 30 different languages. Earth, space, and even the Minecraft universe, there is nowhere Ellen won't go. And now, she's going to the Fritanga Podcast. All right, welcome to the Fritanga Podcast, and Ellen Ochoa is here. Wow. Ellen, you're someone that for all these years I've been at the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. You've served as a source of inspiration, pride, and ganas. And you're actually a comeback. When I hear somebody having some sort of a negative narrative about our community, I come back with, oh, yeah, Ellen Ochoa, um, the first Latina <laughs> astronaut, the first Latina in space, the first Latino or Latina at Johnson Space Center director, and so much more. But I'm going to start with what I think is so cool about you. When you retired and you wrote that it was a natural point to move on to the next phase, it included moving to Boise, Idaho and playing the flute. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> please, please tell me what kind of flute you play and what kind of music. Is it classical, jazz, popular? And I still love the flute on Fly Me to the Moon, you know, with Sinatra and the Count um, Basie Orchestra. Um, I've also witnessed Hillary Dupree and James Galloway performances, but so tell me more about the flute. Tell me about Boise and what you're doing as someone that's going to continue to impact so many. Well, uh, mostly I play classical flute and uh, I've also seen James Galloway and before that Jean-Pierre Rampal, who, you know, when I was growing up, he was, he was the big name on the classical flute scene um, so when I was younger, I was, it was a big part of my life. You know, I played in high school. I was in the California All State Honor Band. I played as an undergraduate in the wind ensemble at San Diego State. I played at Stanford, um, soloed with the Stanford, uh, chamber orchestra. And, uh, even after I finished graduate school, did, did a few solo recitals. So I kind of had to take a break for about, um, 25 or 30 <laughs> years where, I, you know, I would practice a little on my own, but I wasn't playing with a group um, or taking lessons. It was just too hard to, to fit in with my schedule at NASA. But when I came here to Boise, I started taking lessons again. And I now play in a flute orchestra and a community band I was in a concert just three or four days ago. Can we find it? Is it on online anywhere? <laughs> Uh, it is that one. It's called the Capital City Flute Club, 
And um, actually, I, I was uh, featured along with a couple of the other uh, flutists last fall in a performance of Fluter's Holiday. You can find that one online. And uh, the other group is the uh, Capital City Mulligan Band. That is so fantastic. See, that's what, of all things, <laughs> like that's what I think is the coolest about you, that you did that. Um, and so I'm assuming you developed your passion for the flute as a youth, but when did you start your love mm-hmm. for space? Like, what was your inspiration? And if you say watching Lost in Space, I will lose my mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I came to it uh, really because of uh, what was going on um, in the NASA in the late 70s and early 80s. So, you know, of course, I I grew up in the Apollo era and and watched all that. I was 11 when the Apollo 11 astronauts landed on the moon. Um, You know, of course, uh, the entire country, I I would say even the world was watching. It was such a a stunning achievement. But as you know, at that time, no women astronauts, uh, really very little diversity in the astronaut corps at all. Um, But, uh, you know, I'm I'm grateful to a lot of the movements, the civil rights movements in the 60s, the women rights movement in the 70s. Those changed things, opened up a lot of careers for people um, where those careers hadn't been open before. So when I was um, about halfway through my undergraduate, uh, the NASA selected the first group of astronauts that included women and astronauts of color. And that that was a huge deal because it really showed that this was a career that was now open that had previously been closed. And the other thing that happened about the same time was I started to focus on science. Um, I really had not been um, particularly following science at all in high school, hardly took any science at all, in fact, um, just biology. Uh, but I did like math, took a lot of it, continued that in college. And so then I became interested in finding out what subjects actually use that math. And um, you'll, uh, I'll just tell one story that I'm sure will be familiar to a lot of people where I thought I'd go talk to a couple of professors and find out um, what was, you know, what their subjects were like, what their departments were like. So I went to talk to a professor in the electrical engineering department. And it was clear he was not at all interested in having me in his department, Um, uh, not knowing anything about me except just I showed up, you know, and uh, he said, well, we had a woman come through here once, but it's a really difficult course of study. And I don't think you'd be interested, you know, which was ironic because, of course, I'd set up the appointment saying, hey, I'm interested in finding out (laughs) more about what you do in engineering. But fortunately, uh, I had a much different reception when I went to talk to the physics professor. He said he was happy to hear I was interested in physics. Um, he told me about careers that you could have uh, if you majored wow. in physics. And that was really important because I did not have a good idea of, of what people would do with a physics degree. And then when he found out I was finishing up the calculus series, he said, well, that's great. You've already learned the language of physics. If you start into our classes next semester, you can focus on the concepts. And most most students will be trying to learn those two things simultaneously. So I think you do really well. So I think you can see, you know, how the comments of other people, mm-hmm. um, especially when you're student professors or people you run into really have a big impact. And I, you know, I checked it out. I did end up majoring in physics. I got interested in research, went to uh, graduate school at Stanford. And near the end of that first year is when the space shuttle flew for the first time. And two years later, Sally Ride flew, uh, first American woman in space. Three years after that, Franklin Chang Diaz, uh, you know, first um, uh, American with a Hispanic background. And so all these things were sort of happening simultaneously. And because I was interested in doing research, and that's what one of the things the shuttle really allowed you to do experiments you could not do on earth that all combined for me deciding to send in my application as soon as I finished up graduate school. So a couple of things there, Ellen, number one, the civil rights movement and the women's movement went beyond what what we think of. I mean, it it really expanded opportunities for minorities, for women. So much. And then what that professor said to you, 
the 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 bad one, <laughs> um, <laughs> where he <laughs> the discouraging, the discouraging one. one. Yes. <laughs> I consider him a bad one um, because you're supposed to encourage people in an institution right. of higher learning, and to say to you, well, we had a woman come here once. That also, I think, demonstrates the huge burden that a woman feels, and a woman of you know of of Latina descent or African American mm -hmm. woman or Asian woman. Disabled woman, you Even you more. represent everyone yeah. that they've ever met, um, <laughs> because now you're setting a course to hopefully change those perceptions, and you've done mm -hmm. that all your life. Um, can you can you also talk about actually your actual childhood and growing up? I'm curious. There's nothing better than me actually being curious with the person I'm interviewing. So <laughs> I research a little, but not too much, okay. because in yes. real time I want to know about what it was like growing up. Um, as as a as a kid and where you grew up and and mm -hmm. family situations and everything around you. Well, let's see. Uh, I'll go back a little bit to my uh, Hispanic heritage. My dad's parents were Mexican um, in the Sonora area is where they were from. Um, after they were married and had the first few of their children, they emigrated to the U.S. first to Arizona and then to California. And my dad, he was the youngest of 12. So they were already in California when he was born. Um, so he grew up in Southern California. Uh, my mom uh, it was originally from Oklahoma, um, but she had some health issues, asthma. And so she moved with her mom and her sister to Southern California when she was an early teenager. Um, and uh, so uh, they... Uh, met and um, ended up getting married. And my dad worked for Sears and they moved to San Diego when Sears moved him there to be the, um, uh, I guess it was the uh, superintendent of a Sears store. So I moved, I was born in LA myself, but moved to the San Diego area uh, when I was just a year old. And that's where I, I grew up. And so it's not like now that a Latino or Latina can look up to an Ellen Ochoa and have realistic dreams be realized. There was no one like you um, for you to see as a possibility. What drove you into that direction? You talked a little bit about it in college, and it sounds like that's when you started thinking about going into this trajectory. Um, who did you see around you? I mean, you you mentioned a, a Sally Ride and, and, and a couple of other um, astronauts in the past, but... Who did you see just in the STEM fields or in other areas? It doesn't sound like it necessarily came from your your family necessarily. Um, and what what had you explore this? Before you explored space, you had to explore career paths <laughs> and college and everything else on your own. Right. Well, you know, I don't know that there was anybody in the STEM fields when I was younger that, that I was thinking about or, or trying to follow along. I think uh, really the most important thing was just um, my family's emphasis on education and on learning. Mm -hmm. um, my dad was uh, fortunate enough to get an appointment to the Nagel Academy and mm -hmm. so was able to get a college education tuition free. Wow. Um, and my, my mom wasn't able to go to college, uh, you know, as a young woman, in fact, didn't even finish high school at the regular time again, because of her asthma, she wasn't able to stay in school. But after she was married, she got her GED. After we moved to San Diego, um, even though she was in the midst of having and then raising five kids, um, she was just always interested in learning new things. And so she would take, uh, you know, a college class a semester. And I, you know, I just remember that all the time that I was growing up, seeing her talk about the classes she was doing, what she was interested in, seeing her do homework. And so it was just kind of a part of our family to, um, you know, take education seriously, to um, be interested in learning. And I think that was the single most important thing. Once you have that behind you, you know, you can explore a lot of different paths and, you know, sort of already talked about what, what got me onto the science field. Um, before that, I didn't necessarily have a path, but I just, you know, going off to college seemed, I, actually, I didn't go off. I lived at home as an <laughs> undergrad, but, but starting college sure just seemed to be, uh, you know, one of those things that you needed to do. 
I just love that you cite your mom. Um, my mom also got a GED much later in life. I, she must have been in her 50s, early 50s. And, ac and actually, she was already um, yeah, sick uh, from cancer that she ended up passing. But for her to oh, say, goodness. I want to accomplish this after so yeah. many years, and your mom did that too, and that's a source of your inspiration, the, the resilience yes. to, to, to do that. Um, anyway, just I love how you shouted out your mom just now. <laughs> Um, so now there's a couple of generations that have Ellen Ochoa as a role model, an example of what can be done, you know, in space and, and not trying to be cute, but also in a space that has not been representative of our communities and women. I remember interviewing you in Houston with then high school senior Sofia Sanchez Maez from Las Cruces, New Mexico. And she was, she's like one of our highlights in terms of our youth programs and I'm so proud of her and she's now finishing up her PhD program in astrophysics at Harvard oh my goodness that's you terrific. were inspiration <laughs> and when I told her that I was interviewing you and wanted wanted her to be part of the panel just the two of you she lost her mind so what do you what do you say to you? and she still considers you a role model and I'm going to send her this transcript oh. just oh that's fantastic but what do you say to young people interested in space exploration or stem fields in general Oh, well, the first thing I say is we need you, you know, um, we need all the bright minds. And as you well know, talent exists everywhere, yep. but the opportunity doesn't necessarily exist. So um, trying to find out how you match up that talent with opportunity. And a lot of it is um, just encouraging people to look into it, um, to stay the course if it's something that they're interested in. You know, they um, may or probably likely to occasionally run into people who might discourage them. Um, so I always say, you know, find your supporters. Mm. And when I look back on my career, um, you know, the people that did discourage me didn't know me at all. So it wasn't about me. It wasn't about, uh, you know, any anything that I could bring. Right. It, it was really they were kind of showing how they were a product of the culture, you know. Um, but luckily there were always people that did support me and encourage me, whether it was my family or, you know, friends, fellow students, professors, um, supervisors. Um, and they were people who knew me, who knew that I could bring the kinds of qualities that actually lead to success, you know, hard work, the ability to learn, you know, ask questions, um, motivation, you know, the desire to help an organization carry out its mission, just, uh, you know, as NASA does, you know, I think those are the things that are important. I just love that you said, find those that support you, you know, uh, right. in, in, instead of just going up against those that don't, there's, <laughs> there is an easier path to find those that support you. And also that talent right. does exist everywhere. Opportunity doesn't, mm -hmm. but talent does. Right. And thank you for acknowledging that. Um, and, and I just want to shout you out as a STEM legend that is musical and creative too. Like it's important to have that creative side and that bleeds into the technical aspects of the work for an even more effective and productive problem solving and, and leads to innovation. So I, you're rare in terms of that. Usually one, you know, it's almost like you're, it's a binary choice of going into something like right. music, but you've been able to do both. So, um, okay. So. I want to get into the youth part of it and what makes you the coolest astronaut ever. And yes, I said that ever. So you were featured as part of the first Latino theme Minecraft game. And thank you, Lila Silva and, and the team over at Minecraft. That was played by millions of young students across the world in about 30 different languages. And it had a teacher's guide and a parent's guide. So it went along with it. Um, these children were guided through space exploration by you in their format in a game. Um, and yes, you have a Minecraft character. So however iconic you were before, <laughs> you're more iconic now. Um, the game was launched during Space Week at the White House with the National Space Council. Thank you, Solt uh, Ortega and everyone else that put that together um, and Dr. Quincy Brown. Um, but what did being part of that video game mean to you, your legacy and reaching kids on their terms, which shows your influence continues to inspire across the all platforms, that was just this past year. Well, first of all, you know, thank you to you. Thank <laughs> you to Minecraft. Unless, you know, people put these things together, it doesn't happen. It certainly, 
you know, would never have come just for me directly. Yeah, but you saying but yes for- is a big <laughs> deal. <laughs> you are the number one choice. And when you said it was you, Gloria Stefan, and of course, my friend Monica Ramirez, but to have, and it was all women in different areas of impact. So thank you for saying yes and always being oh, well. so willing to do anything you can to impact our community. It was my pleasure. And, and uh, as you know, I continue to do outreach in a variety of ways. And so when an opportunity like that comes up, which is, you know, kind of a completely different way of doing outreach than, yeah. you know, speaking or, or being on a podcast <laughs> or, you know, all these other kinds of things that I do. Well, you know, I always look at it to say, is this, is this a way to, uh, you know, potentially influence kids in a positive way in a medium that really speaks to them, right? Um, something they will enjoy doing and, and then hopefully take away these lessons as well. So I thought it was a, a terrific opportunity. And, and, uh, you know, it just, uh, I love to see, um, the variety of ways in which, um, working together, we can, we can all get the word out. And, and taking it beyond, like you said, what has traditionally been a way to communicate with with young people and to have you be a part of that um, was such a privilege for us in terms of being able to leverage those that are within our network. Um, and I mean, our broader network of, of inspirational Latinas um, and to be able to feature you was a huge deal for me. And so uh, thank you for doing that. And you reached millions and millions and it's still in the top games on Minecraft education. Um, oh, fantastic. And, and I will have to say this too, because it's important based on what we're talking about. Every single person that worked on putting that game together, and there were over a hundred, were all Latino and Latina. And I have to give credit to Lila for making that happen on the Minecraft side of things. But um, we want to also send that message and the game was offered completely for free. So mm-hmm. um, I, yes. I appreciate you always being willing to do whatever it takes um, to guide our youth into these wonderful career paths and give them confidence and um, and certainly give them a role model. So now I'm going to get into the importance of space exploration and has been highlighted to me over and over again by my, my friend, Dr. Quincy Brown, who is the director of space and STEM at Workforce Policy at the White House. I had no idea what can be learned from space, uh, whether it's data collection that impacts environmental issues, <laughs> transportation, right. commerce, Pretty much everything going on on Earth can be informed by space. Please educate me and your and our listeners about the critical importance of space exploration beyond what we think it is. Well, this is a good day to be talking about it because it's Earth yeah. Day 2024. And so there really is a focus on our planet. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, as I said, one of the reasons I really got interested in space exploration myself was the opportunity to learn from space and to use first the space shuttle, now the International Space Station as a laboratory in space. In fact, my first two missions, we were studying the Earth and specifically the Earth's atmosphere and the problem of the ozone hole and ozone depletion. And of course, there's a famous Hispanic Nobel Prize winner, Mario Molina, Mm. who made the connection between the human's use of chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs on Earth, and uh, byproducts of those getting into the upper atmosphere and then actually destroying ozone. So we had a suite of instruments that were measuring a lot of these byproducts in all different altitudes um, through the atmosphere and also measuring the amount of light coming from the sun in different wavelengths, because there is a natural variation to that. And so it was part of trying to understand, okay, what are the human effects? What are the natural effects from the sun? And what is this going to tell us about uh, what's going to happen to the atmosphere in the future? That's absolutely re- so that, remarkable. So that's just one example that I got to be part of. Uh, you can point to so many. Um, there is a lot of study of the Earth from space. Um, a lot of it, to me, though, is also the excitement of understanding what it takes to live off the planet. Um, you know, we've developed uh, life support systems. We've understood a lot more about human health and performance in space. But everything we learn about that also has applicability uh, here on Earth. 
Um, you know, uh, there are changes to bones and muscle in space, and we can actually use that to understand uh, about um, diseases on Earth, like osteoporosis. Mm. Um, we've grown prote human proteins in space, including on some of my um, shuttle flights, and they just grow in a more natural way that allows when we bring them back to Earth for their structure to be understood. And that helps people who try to develop medicines for certain type, types of you know, human conditions or, or human diseases. The life support systems that we've developed, um, for example, we have a, a water reclamation system on the International Space Station that uh, recycles water, including urine, turns it back into drinking water, and that same technology is actually being used on Earth in remote areas. So even as we learn more about space, there are always ties back to benefit to people on Earth. In fact, I, I really like the motto of the International Space Station, which is off the Earth for the Earth. That's perfect, actually. And and again, on Earth Day, thank you for giving us those examples. Um, and there's so much more in terms of data collection, in terms of transportation and, 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 and right. global warming and all of these other things that you could learn from, from space. Um, but Ellen, back to being the first in so many parts of your remarkable career. And, and you mentioned being turned away um, by one of your, one of your potential professors. Um, I imagine that there was so many other challenges in being the only Latina or the only woman in the room uh, in, in so many of those journeys. And we get a lot of questions and we work with young people, as you know, and about overcoming everything from sexism to imposter syndrome to navigating internal politics that you may not have known from not being exposed to them when you were younger or even managing like low expectations of others while holding yes. on to our high expectations that need <laughs> to be even higher than others because of having to represent everyone that isn't in those rooms. Can you talk about some of what you dealt with and, and not just in college that you mentioned earlier, but mm -hmm. across your entire career? Yeah, I, you know, it seemed to me that it was probably most obvious as I was going through school and maybe early in my career. Um, you know, just one other example, when I was um, getting ready to take the entrance exam for the PhD program at Stanford, um, the way the exam is given is it's... Um, a student meets indi individually um, with 10 different professors for 12 minutes, and the whole exam is oral. The professor can ask anything they want, student answers. There's nothing written down. Professor provi provides a score, and then um, you add up the scores. And uh, one of my friends, another grad student, heard one of the professors talking a week before the exam. Well, I've never passed a woman in this uh, oh, Tess and I never will because they don't belong in the department. Oh. I'm sure the person or others had the same feeling about others who are underrepresented mm -hmm. in STEM, right? They didn't see them, couldn't really picture them. Um, and, you know, I was probably naive, but I was really kind of shocked because I really thought it depended on my own knowledge, my own preparation <laughs> for the exam. And I realized, oh, there's this whole other part I don't don't really even know about or appreciate. Uh, fortunately, I didn't get that particular professor. I did pass the exam. I got into the PhD program, but you can imagine that there are people who didn't get in, yeah. who should have um, because of that. Um, on, on the flip side, just like I said, find your supporters. I had um, some great PhD advisors. I had really kind of two of them, a primary one and another one. Um, one was theoretical, one experimental. They both, um, you know, never gave me the impression they didn't think I should be there. They were supportive. It's always tough to get through a PhD program, but, you know, certainly they provided that encouragement and I'm still in contact with them, you know, 40 years later. So uh, I was lucky to, again, always have those people who were encouraging me as well. And, you know, I saw various things like that as, as I went through my career. Um, just people who hadn't seen someone like me in a particular position and couldn't, couldn't quite picture it or it did, never occurred to them. Maybe I could be in that position. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I just kept working away. Um, 
I was uh, a hard worker. I, I tried to learn. I uh, think I have the ability to learn quickly. And so it did get to a point in my career where people would think of me and mention my name for opportunities. It, it you know, took a little while to get there, but um, I was fortunate that people then um, you know, started mentioning my name as various management and leadership positions opened at NASA. Isn't that great that you went from no one having seen someone like you to now <laughs> they mention you? As an example. Exactly. That. So that's, that's full circle. Hey, I have to ask you, did, you stayed in touch with some of the folks for your PhD program that were supported. Right. Did you stay in touch yeah. with the, the advisor or the, the head of that department in terms of physics um, and that encouraged you? Oh, you know, I saw him one or two times, but, um, uh, you know, I think he passed away, you know, before I was really into my career or at NASA. Um, but, uh, Dr. Scolil, so I'll, I'll give him, I'll give him some credit. <laughs> I, I just love hearing that. I've, I've always said the two greatest, um, motivators in my life have been somebody that believes in me and somebody that doesn't believe in me. They both work about <laughs> as well, but your advice is to go to those believing in you. <laughs> okay. So I can't let you out of here without asking what it was like to be in space. Um, can you paint us a picture of what was going through your mind as you look back and saw our planet? from such a powerful perspective and how it felt to take so many of us with you, including like, did you think about your family while you were up there? Did you think <laughs> about everything that you had accomplished up to that point? Um, and also how did your time in space shape your worldview and your perspective on the universe, not just on what was your universe in that, you know, small towns or in Southern California or in parts of Arizona as you were growing mm -hmm. up, like, did all of I keep thinking that all of that would whirl in my head as I was up there. <laughs> well, first I will say we are very busy when we're up there on a, on a shuttle flight. You're not so up there contemplating. <laughs> there's not a lot of time for introspection, but certainly it's an amazing experience. You know, it's unlike really anything you can experience here on Earth, and uh, and and one of the most amazing parts is is viewing the Earth from space. And I mentioned we were studying the Earth's atmosphere on our first two flights. And as you as you look out at the Earth and you're you're looking at the curvature, and you see this just very thin blue line across the curvature of the Earth. That's our atmosphere. And not only is it beautiful, but you just look at it and you think how fragile it is. And you realize um so life on earth depends on having that atmosphere mm. and it be con being c continuing to be conducive to life on earth. And, um, you know, if people could sort of look at it and see the fragility, maybe they'd have a little bit different view of a uh, human's impact on it. Uh, but of course, everywhere you look down on the earth, you know, um, you're orbiting 16 times every 24 hours. So you get to see all different parts of earth. And for me, um, California was always what caught my eye um, <laughs> because before I moved to Houston to join the astronaut yeah. Corps, I lived in California for my whole life, Southern California. And then and you could actually Northern see it California. from up there? Oh, oh, of course. Yeah. We had a couple good paths where we were essentially traveling down the coast of California so I could pick out the Bay Area with Stop. binoculars. I could actually pick out the red roofs of Stanford. Oh, actually with a, a long, a long lens on the camera. Could pick out, of course, San Diego Bay, which is, is uh, very distinctive. So that would certainly, um, bring me to thoughts of my family and friends and, and, uh, my, most of my life up until that point. Um, you know, I had the chance to go into space four times, and I think um, there's two overwhelming impressions. And one is that our Earth is beautiful and it is fragile and we need to take care of it. It's really one interconnected system. We, we tend to subdivide everything, you know, whether it's uh, into continents, countries and states and cities or um, kind of separating the atmosphere from the land and the ocean, but it, it all works together. And again, I think Earth Day is a day to try to fully appreciate that. The other main thing is the power of a team. Mm. Uh, you know, when you have a team working together on a goal that uh, people feel is important, um, is challenging and is rewarding, you know, 
it made me feel there's nothing that we can't accomplish. And so that's what gives me optimism for the future. We just have to get people coalesced around the goals that um, are important for, uh, for people to thrive and to thrive well into the future. That is so powerful. I actually just wrote that down and, um, you know, from space, our earth is so beautiful and fragile and we need to take care of it. That it, such a powerful quote for Earth Day that I'm going to use it on whatever post HHF does. So thank you for that. Um, can you talk about the state of space travel today? And it just seems so much broader than when you were in space with the increasing okay. private and personal interest. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see us going from here um, as we continue to explore beyond Earth? And, and are we in a better place because of it? Where should we be? Like, what's your vision for space travel? Well, I think it's an exciting time for space exploration in general, both on the science side and on the human side. But certainly, as you mentioned, more opportunities, different types of opportunities for people to go into space. Um, you know, just on the NASA side, as you know, NASA now buys services from companies to deliver astronauts to and from the International Space Station. SpaceX has delivered eight crews now, plus mm. the original test flight of crew. And uh, Boeing is hope hoping to launch their first crew on a test flight actually next month in May. And then that would give uh, NASA two companies from which to um, continue to buy these services for. And then NASA has its site set on beyond low Earth orbit, so they've developed a new rocket, uh, the SLS, a new spacecraft, Orion, which uh, Johnson Space Center is in charge of that program, working with Lockheed Martin as the prime contractor. Um, there's uh, Those two work together as the main components of the Artemis program, which is essentially um, NASA's beyond low Earth orbit, moon to Mars program. And the first flight of Artemis One was about a year and a half ago. Uh, no people on board, but testing out the new rocket, the new spacecraft. And Orion went, you know, beyond the moon and around and, and coming back to Earth. Um, the first crew that will fly on it um, has been named, is in training, and hopefully will launch in the second half of next year. Um, and again, it will fly around the moon and essentially test out all the life support systems, the things that could not be tested mm -hmm. um, when you didn't have people on board. And then hopefully the third flight will actually land uh, on the moon. And uh, NASA has said that crew will include the first woman and the first person of color to step foot on the moon. So I think that's a, a huge milestone to be looking for um, in the Artemis program. That is so wonderful that you are part of that opportunity that is presenting itself. Thank you for that. Would you ever go back up? <laughs> Um, if I had the opportunity and it was something that I felt um, I could contribute either scientifically you know, or in an outreach way, um, you know, be a, a marvelous opportunity. And as you know, NASA itself looks to more and more commercial companies to provide services, including as they look at their Artemis program, a lot of that um, and the pre precursor to it, landing payloads on the moon. Um, they're using commercial companies. And um, as you mentioned, um, the whole idea of sort of buying services from commercial companies was uh, that hopefully those companies would have other customers, non-NASA, non-government customers, and that would um, help bring down the cost for NASA and allow other types of uh industry to to thrive in low earth orbit and i think it's very similar to what's happened in other inter industries mm -hmm. throughout throughout history and so you are seeing more flights like that and and hopefully more opportunities in the future i would love to have you go back up and like <laughs> and and you know have it on social media as you're going up <laughs> that wasn't around the first time you went up um okay as we're wrapping up, I have to share that my daughter, Mercedes, is a freshman at San Diego State University. Oh, fantastic. And when I was visiting with her, she was showing me around campus and she stopped in front of a building and said, this building is named after a famous astronaut. 
<laughs> and it was the Ellen Ochoa building. And my heart oh, yes. started swelling with pride. And so did hers. When she found out, I said, I, I know her and told her about your impact on our community beyond having a building. Like there's a living, breathing person um, and, and on our country and on our planet. One thing is when people talk about an impact on our community or an impact on our country, then the planet and then beyond the planet. And, and that's, <laughs> that's the space that you sit in. Um, and I remember sending you a, a picture of us in front of it. Um, letting you know that we're standing in front of your building. So, yeah. um, so yes, Ellen Ochoa is an Aztec. And can you talk about that legacy to have young people like my daughter walk by that building with such reverence, but more importantly, the possibilities? Well, yeah, you, it was fantastic uh, when the um, president of San Diego State, uh, Adela de la Torre, um, uh, contacted me and said they wanted to dedicate one of their buildings um, in my name. And they were looking to um, select a, a, you know, a couple of alumni who um, might not normally have a building named after them. You know, in most cases, the way that happens on college campuses is is somebody provides a, a very large gift. Right. Well, you know, well, you I've did too the, in a different way. I've worked for the government <laughs> my whole life. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I didn't really have the opportunity to do that, but they felt it was important to um, pick people, you know, of different kinds of backgrounds who have gone on to make an impact in one way or another and to make sure that incoming students would have um, knowledge of some of these alumni. And I thought that was a, a great program. And so, again, um, not everybody who walks by that building is going to know who I am, but maybe they'll, you know, ch uh, check it out and uh, get some inspiration and realize, hey, a lot of the decisions I made when I was at San Diego State are what led to my career. And they could be in a similar position thinking about goals that they may have for themselves, how education can help them reach those goals. As a proud papa of an Aztec, I'm going to give you, <laughs> I'm going to give you my Mount Rushmore of Aztecs, Kawhi Leonard, Tony Gwynn, Marshall Falk, <laughs> and Dr. Ellen Ochoa. And I know that you root for the Aztecs when they play against the Cardinal of Stanford in basketball. <laughs> well, that's a that's a tough one, okay? But uh, they both they both have a place in my heart for sure. <laughs> Most of the time, they're not playing each other, right? Well, so that makes it easier okay. on you. I can root for both. <laughs> I can root for both. Of course, you are. Um, okay, so as we wrap up, this culture comfort moment is really important. Our our podcast's goal is not only to bring information, inspiration, perspective, connection, and action to our listeners, but create a space for them to find comfort and community through our cultura. Um, and I am so proud, too, that we honored you with our Hispanic Heritage Award many years. And I would love to have you come back on September 5th at the Kennedy Center. Um, please join us. And nothing would make me happier than to <laughs> sit you next to me. Well, thank you. Um, thank that you. would be wonderful. So um, nature, music, food, dance, literature, art, they all provide the cura to what ails us. And there's a lot we have to overcome, too, to get to mental health and everything else. So what brings you comfort? Um, which is also a passion for you. So um, I know music. Uh, so mm -hmm. what songs yeah. um, bring you comfort? <laughs> and, and I really want to hear, maybe it's something your abuelita was singing or your mom was singing or your, or your dad was singing, or maybe it's something that you now are listening to now. Um, and then as well as what foods um, and nature, I would imagine after seeing it from space, you know, mm -hmm. now you get to see it as you take walks, for instance, and, and feel comforted by, by nature. So what are, give me those three things. Okay. Well, let me, um, first of all, I do love traveling. I do love getting outside. One of the reasons we live in Boise, Idaho, is we can walk in the hills and along the river that goes through town um, just from our front door. Oh. So there's a lot of um, uh, beauty just, uh, just outside our home. And we talked a little bit about music, but it, it reminds me of something that I wanted to mention, and, and this is very timely. So uh, two or three years ago, I was approached by a publishing company started by a couple of Latinas, and all they publish is bilingual children's books. So they're called Little Libros. And they said, we don't have much in the STEM area, and we wanted to see if you would be willing to write children's books. 
And we'd like you to write a series of five, one for each of the letters of STEAM. And that, of course, includes the A. So science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And um, that was something I'd never thought about before, but um, they paired me with a wonderful illustrator, Sitlali Reyes. And so now four of those five books are out. And just two or three weeks ago, uh, the arts one came out. And yesterday I was at the LA Times Festival of Books um, talking about the arts book and then, and then signing for them. And it, it talks very much about what we um, have already talked about, how both art and science mm. are about creativity. They're about curiosity. They're about trying to understand the world around us. And, and I think arts also really provides that um, emotional connection to our world. Yeah. So one of the illustrations happens to be um, a woman in a spacesuit playing a flute, and I did get to play my flute in space. So um, it's quite personal as well. But it, it talks about the, the the different arts that are out there and and how they um, help express our emotions, our opinions, um, help us uh, make sense of the world around us. And so I think that really makes that connection that for me is important. And as you said at the near the beginning, it's not about choosing between STEM and the arts. You know, there are places for us to have many different um, uh, subjects that we follow, many different things that are important to us. You may end up choosing a career in one, but you're probably going to use creativity and curiosity Absolutely. no matter which way you go. And you can take comfort. Um, in the other interests that you have and continue to pursue those. Beautiful. Now, how about food? Leave us with food <laughs> that brings you comfort. Well, uh, gosh, first of all, my husband is a great cook. He even uh, took a sabbatical from his, um, he has both a, a PhD in engineering and a law degree and became an intellectual property lawyer, but he took a few months sabbatical a number of years ago and got a chef de cuisine license. Huh. So I'll first just say anything my husband cooks <laughs> is helpful. Smart. Um, but th thinking back to my childhood, um, I, I can remember going to my um, grandmother's house. We called her Mama Grande. And my aunts would be um, preparing tamales for the for a big family. Usually, usually it was for a wedding or I can remember my grandmother's 90th birthday party. We didn't get together often necessarily, but when we did, you know, there was certainly um, a, a big chance to sort of learn and understand more about my dad's side of the family. All right, now leave us with a song that we should all listen to. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I can, uh, I can think, you know, um, I mostly listen to classical music. My brother um, is the principal music librarian for the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Really? So one, yeah. So one of the things I love to do is to go hear them play um, in the summer. I try to get out to the Tanglewood Music Festival in Western Massachusetts, and uh, you know, there's nothing like hearing, which I had the chance to do, hearing the Boston Symphony Orchestra along with the chorus that accompanies them doing uh, Beethoven's Ninth. Mm. You know, and hearing Ode to Joy. I mean, it just washes over you in a way that is. Um, to me, just incredibly emotional. And I, I feel lucky to, you know, have an experience like that. And we feel lucky to have you on the Fritanga podcast <laughs> on this earth, in this universe. Thank you, Dr. Ellen Ochoa, for gracing us today and inspiring us. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure.